All right, welcome back to Computer Science E75, Lecture 11 Framework. So this is our last recorded lecture for the semester. You've got a couple of weeks respite, which is not meant to be so much a respite as it is an opportunity to focus on final projects. Uh, your proposals have come in. If you haven't heard back from your teaching fellows, yay or nay on your proposal, you should hear back by tonight or tomorrow. Certainly follow up with them directly if you have any questions in the meantime. Uh, milestones coming up, a status report in just a week or so, which is really meant to just remind you that you have a final project coming up and then the thing itself is due several weeks hence. Our final lecture is not so much a lecture as it will be a uh, computer science fair, which will be in a location to be announced on campus. But what I think we'll do is we'll order in some food. We'll invite you all to bring you and your you distance students out there, if you're local enough, to bring laptops and such in. And we'll do demonstrations, effectively, of some folks' final projects, do a bit of mingling, and just generally wrap up the semester in hopefully a nice collegial way. Uh, so this whole semester, we've spent a lot of time doing things from the ground up. So working toward dynamic websites, but really trying to take the hood off of uh, various things like Apache and MySQL and Linux itself. Well, there comes a point where it's not so much fun to re keep reinventing the wheel and to keep re-implementing certain uh, constructs or certain pieces of functionality that you might like to reuse in other projects. And so <laughs> tonight's lecture, to be delivered here by our own Dan Amandars, is about <laughs> I never get that. Okay. <laughs> so you don't that's, deserve it. Let's go. Oh. <laughs> um, so tonight's all about frameworks, um, namely Cake PHP and jQuery, two very popular frameworks for JavaScript and PHP, respectively, that are meant to simplify the process of um, developing dynamic websites and meant to return, if you will, some of the fun to doing the same. So without further ado, Dan. Hello, everyone. Well, it's one of David's classic tricks to get everyone all sugared up just in case the, uh, the guest lecture is boring. And uh, so I'll try not to be too boring um, this time. But one of the things that may have been boring, though, all of this time is all of the repetitive code that you've had to type over and over just to get very basic, very rudimentary structure up for your websites, especially for the latter projects, project two, project three, getting all the tables set up, getting all the code set up just so you can view the contents of those tables is a non-trivial task. And so, like David introduced, a lot of these frameworks that, or these frameworks that I will be talking about today can actually make it much, much simpler in order to get your project off the ground and, and hit the ground running, so to speak. And so, for um, many of your projects, I'm sure for those of you that are new to PHP, you probably started out somewhat procedurally doing all of the uh, commands one right after the other and just trying to, you know, kludge it together to make it work. And uh, for those of you that are more seasoned programmers and those of you that have tried to venture out and try to abstract your projects a little bit, you may have started coming up with a specific type of model to just try to simplify and try to abstract all of these various layers for your application. And this is one model that um, some people like to to, uh, to use, and this is the model view controller framework. And so it's pretty simple. It's, it basically works from the starting from the client, which of course is the web browser, who sends a request to the server. On the server, there is a script called the dispatcher that decides what to do with that request. And specifically, it decides which controller to send that request to. So these are all fancy words, and it, you know I see a lot of people's brows furring over but it actually simplifies this process a lot. So let's just say for a moment that we are trying to create an address book application. So for an address book, address book application online, what are some of the things that we would need? OK, contacts. And how will we store those contacts? Yeah, database. That's a good way to do it. OK, so that means that we have to have a database probably MySQL, since that's what we are so familiar with. And we must have some PHP logic to be able to query the database and update the database and these sorts of things. And so, uh, and before you even have that happening, you have to have some way of querying or asking the client, the user, what they want to do with this data. And so, starting from the client, they say, OK, I want to find all of the records in my address book. So that request is sent to the dispatcher. The dispatcher from there says, OK, well, this request deals with querying the database. So it will look up or it will contact the controller for the address book. So that request gets passed over to the controller. And so the controller is basically the heart of all of this, of all of this process. It's where everything happens. It controls all of this uh, from going on. So 
the, the controller will contact the model, or the database in this case, to perform the necessary query depending on what the user requested or what the user wants to do to the, uh, the model. And then the model will return data to the controller. So that's what the two arrows are for. So the, the controller speaks to or communicates with the model, which in turn finds the, you know, the implementation details aren't necessarily that important to the controller, but it knows that the model will then return the data to it. From there, the data that to be displayed gets passed over to view. And then view puts all of the data and, you know, it puts it in a nice fancy table or what have you and sends that out to the client. So in this way, you separate all of the various aspects or the major aspects of your website, all of the logic in your controller, the specific implementation details of your data structures. So that would be the model uh, and the way that you can show all of this information via the view. So this MVC or model view controller thing is what many of these frameworks are built on. And have any of you heard of Ruby on Rails? Yeah, it's, it's pretty popular. Do, for those of you that raised up your hands, do you know how it works or do you just know of it? Okay, so most of you. So um, for those of you that don't know, Ruby on Rails actually works somewhat similar to this. And Cake PHP is actually something of a Ruby on Rails for PHP. It really simplifies all of this process and it uses that MVC model in order to do it. So this is actually... Um, Pretty neat software. Uh, so let's see. Let's say we want to just download it. It's just a zip file full of PHP files that you can download straight off of the website. And they have a couple of different versions. They have a 1.2 beta and a 1.1 and all of this stuff. And a lot of the code that you'll be seeing today is from the 1.1 stable release. And so just keep that in mind because there are differences between the two. Now, the way that Cake PHP works is it it has all of the files to assemble this model view controller framework for you. All you do is you insert your logic into the appropriate section. So you insert your logic into the controller section, you insert your logic into the model section, and Cake PHP does all the rest. So this still may sound kind of abstract and kind of confusing. We'll definitely go over quite a few examples right now, but there's a few things about Cake PHP that you should know. And first of all, that there's very few configuration files that you have to deal with. So as you're creating your models, as you're creating your controllers, your views, they, all base, they are all based not so much on configuration files, but conventions. You have to name all of them in a very specific way in order for CakePHP to be able to recognize the files and be able to use them. So there's a very obvious downside to this, and that's that you have to know all of the rules and all of this stuff. But the very obvious upside is that you don't have to deal with configuration files to find all of these various files for all of the models, for all of the views, all of the controllers that you have. As long as you adhere to their convention, you're all set to go. So just a few of these. This is kind of a, this is just a table that I threw together from examples on Kick PHP's website where they have a manual that, that goes into quite a bit of detail about how to uh, do all of this and what all of the conventions are. But basically, um, <clears throat> the controllers are plural versions in camel case, and the models which the uh, controller speaks to, remember to query for the data, is a, uh, a singular version of that plural form. And so one of the things that confused me the very first time I was looking at Cake PHP was, well, how does it know? What is the difference? How on earth does it possibly know all of these various things? And there's actually... Uh, Oh, I didn't know I was going to show you this, but um, there is actually a, uh, a class within Cake PHP that handles all of this information for you. And it looks really quite, um, let's see. It looks quite complicated and, and really disgusting, but it does all of the work for you, and that is that it literally has embedded in it many, many rules to convert singular words to pluralized forms of them. So this is what's happening behind the scenes. You don't have to really know that this exists. 
you don't really even have to look at it, and nor should you ever modify it or anything like that because you might mess up how it works. But Cake PHP really puts a lot of the magic into writing one of these frameworks or writing uh, within the framework some code for your particular application. And so um, I would scroll through this, but it has uh, specific examples of words that are probably not very friendly for the camera. So moving on. Okay. Um, so file names are all lowercase, and there you have uh, underscores between all of the words and all that stuff, so on and so forth. Views are uh, basically files, as we'll see in just a minute, about how... Uh, so the, the controller will contact a view, and the view has to be named a very specific thing as well in order for it to work. So, okay, let's go back to this example that I mentioned before. We want to create an address book. So we already decided that we'll use MySQL in order to create a table in it, what are some of the things that we should have? So this is going to be really basic, sort of an online address book. First name, last name. First name, last name, good. Email address. Email address, perfect. Yeah, I mean, you could argue phone, whatever. And uh, just for an example, this is the table setup that I used. Uh, there's an ID, first name, last name, email, phone, comments, if you want to write specific comments about a person, this guy's a scumbag, etc. cetera. Um, when, when the record was created and when slash if the record was modified. So this seems pretty straightforward, doesn't it? So this is just an example of create, read, update, delete sort of idea that we want to implement. And that's, um, it's an unfortunate acronym, CRUD, but it's one that CakePHP uh, has all throughout their documentation. And one of the things that CakePHP does for you that's very easy is to be able to create, read, update, and delete all of the records within this table very, very easily. So you have to realize that there's one more thing about CakePHP before we dive in. So it deals all with classes and such, but this is literally, if when you're just starting out with CakePHP, this is literally all the code you need in the controllers file in order to create a CRUD application or a create, read, update, delete application. It's the important bit right here is this, the declaration of the scaffold variable. With the declaration of that, CakePHP recognizes that you just want to have a very basic outline of an application. You just want to see what the model looks like. And so I may be getting a little bit ahead of myself here, but you'll see what I mean. So um, when you start out with CakePHP, it actually, let's see. All right, so when you download Cake PHP and put it on your web server and you start it up after you set all of the permissions and there's a lot of folders and a lot of files, so it's a lot to go through. But after you get all of that done, then what you get is this page. It's pretty handy. It some, has some links to resources that tell you how to work Cake PHP and uh, it tells you what you have to do in order to get started. And at the very top, it says that my database configuration file is not present. So. That means that first I have to create a database, which is already done, luckily, and update a specific configuration file, which I've also already done. Uh-oh. All right. So it says that my, it's, that it's not found. I guess it's because I named it cake2 instead of cake1. Wow, that's embarrassing. Oh, it is? Yeah, because it's, it's still saying you can't find cake one. Oh, okay. Oh, I see. Wrong wireless. That's why. Okay, so what this should say is that I've updated the configuration file, and it should be able to tell you that it's connected to the database and that you can feel free to start writing your cake application. Let me try this one more time. Okay, so up here at the very top. <coughs> Your database configuration file is present and Cake is able to connect to the database. So again, the specifics aren't very important. It's one of the few configuration files that you have to deal with is telling Cake what the server is, all of the username, the password, all of that junk that you guys are very familiar with. So now what we want to do is I've, I've created the table. Now I just want to see what Cake will show me uh, just straight out of the box as soon as I create a very basic model, view, and controller. So 
Let's see. So under cake slash addresses, all I've done is literally just created that controller file that has defined that scaffold variable. I defined a very, very, very basic, very rudimentary model file. And also, I didn't even touch any views. And what it shows me is the records that exist in this table. And so as you can see right now, there are currently no records in it. So we might as well just add one right now. So first name, Dan, last name, Armandaris, my email address, a fake phone number, and the best TF in the world. OK. Click Save. And now you can see that already, just with a few lines of code, CakePHP has done a lot of the work for me. It shows me all of this information. Now you notice that at the very end, there's the created and modified fields in that table. They're auto-populated by Cake. So just like um, how the model versus the view versus the controller are all found by cake based on their singularity or their pluralization, you can actually define certain fields in the, um, in the database, in the table, that cake will be able to modify automatically, so to speak. And these are some of the things that it is able to do. So created, it knows what a created field is. As long as you set it to the proper date time in MySQL, you'll be fine. And modified is the same thing. And also, same thing with the ID. You'll notice that I didn't, oops. You notice that I didn't touch the ID field, and it's seven because of my testing earlier on, but um, it also, uh, also because of the auto increment in MySQL, it's able to do all this. So further, is this yeah, this is, this is well, um, remember that that model, the model controller, the controller model view aspect, all of that goes on in the background. We as clients do not see it. Um, what is showing us is the view, um, but with the scaffold, it's just like the name implies. It's just a rudimentary structure that's temporary that is created just so that you have a very basic idea. You have something to work with at the beginning. This yes. Is what the user sees, basically, right? That's the view. Yeah, I mean, this, this is what we as users would see. However, this is not a production level application. So, yes. Analogous to the list view in PHP MyAdmin, yeah. Or yes. Right, exactly. Yes, I mean, as you can see, there's actions in the right. I'm, I'm actually getting to these right now. So there's additional views that, that you can deal with that uh, the scaffolding <laughs> provides automatically. Oh, yes, yes. For the same model, you can have different views. You can, uh, yes, because you'll have a different view, for example, when you want to view one record versus when you want to view multiple records versus when you want to edit one record, for example. All of these are different views, but they're all dealing with the same model, the same data structure that's occurring. So you can even have, you even, as, as is the case here, you have the same controller with multiple views for the same reason. All of the logic resides in the controller. You just have multiple views because you're separating the view from the data storage and the, and the, the logic itself. Okay. So, Sorry, one other sure, of course. Uh, so where, what, what is the controller in this context, in this application? So the controller we can't see, but I'll, I'm, I'm going to show you the code for all of this in just a little bit. Okay, anything else? All right, so notice that as part of the scaffolding, we are provided a rudimentary set of actions at the far right of the table, a view, an edit, and a delete. And so these do exactly what you would expect. You can view specific records, you can edit specific records, and you can delete specific records. So trust me, this is very few lines of code, as you'll see in just a minute. And I, I urge you to try to do it in fewer lines of code than you can in Cake PHP. However, this is a good thing in terms of scaffolding because normally when you're first starting an application, you're not sure all of the, the data structures or, or all of the fields that you're going to use in your database. And so you can take a look at it in this view and uh, just make sure that it's all set up and that you can start adding logic to your controller as, as we'll see in just a minute. Okay, so the code itself. I also have that up here somewhere. Let's see. Okay, so this is kind of small, sorry, but notice that here there are two folders specifically. So 
uh, I took these two folders out of the cake PHP install. There's a very specific place you're supposed to put them, but it divides it very easily for you. You put all of the controllers, classes in the controllers folder, all of the models in the models, all of the views in the views, etc. So let's just take a look at the control. So this is the control for it. Class addresses controller extends app controller. So this declaration, this there is a, a class in Cake PHP called app controller that uh, that you build your application upon. It has a lot of methods uh, already in place for you to get started. And so all you have to do is just create a controller that uh, abides by the conventions according to Cake PHP. So remember that controllers must be pluralized. So here and there it must be camel case. So addresses controller. Um, extends that app controller and in it I just define, I explicitly define the name of the class called addresses. This is a limitation of PHP 4 but I probably wouldn't need that in PHP 5 but it's, it's recommended and again I said that in order to create your scaffold all you have to do is create a scaffold variable. Done. That's all you have to do for your controller. Sorry, you said that the name of the class addresses? Yes. That is this class. This is a class that extends the um, app controller class in Cake PHP. Yes, but that's because this is a convention in Cake PHP. Since this is a controller class, Cake PHP knows that as a controller, it's the name of the class appended with controller at the very end. So um, you can have addresses controller, you can have hello controller, and name would be hello, etc. Putting the name, putting the what's the significance of putting the name in in var name? Yep. So that's just so that it can be uh, referenced at, at some later point in time. It's it's uh, a requirement for Cake PHP in order to function. No, without it, it would not run. And the reason the reason that we have to do it in the first place is because of limitation PHP. But um, I mean, besides that, it, Cake PHP does require that definition to be able to run this controller. So there's very little logic in here, right? It might be somewhat confusing, but bear with me again. So realize that this is just, the controller is just the aspect that does all of the communication, that stores all of the logic between the model uh, and sends that information to the view and receives requests from the dispatcher. So right now, a lot of Cake PHP's built-in logic is doing a lot of the hard work for us, especially with this scaffold variable defined. So there's one more aspect that we need to take a look at for this example, and that is the models. In this case, this is all we need here, too. Class address extends app model. And again, we have to define the name address. So realize that this is a camel cased singular form of the controller, and that is how Cake PHP knows where to find the model for that controller is by looking for that singularized form of it. Is that even a word? I don't know. It sounds good. Singularized. So here we have basically half a dozen lines of code minus all the comments that I have. And we are able to create, just look at the table that we have in place right now. It's very, very simple. It's very rudimentary. And you certainly wouldn't want to use it in a production level application, but it works and it shows you what you can build on now. Any questions about this so far? Yes? Um, is the fact that there's no views folder just, a, just because you didn't download it? You didn't... There is no views folder because I made no modifications to the views. Okay. Um, there is, so um, let me talk a little bit more and I, I think I, I'll be able to answer your question as I, as I go on. So let's take a look at the URL at the very top. So not the domain name, that's not important, but and it says cake3 slash addresses. So there is, an, there is an HT access file in here that's performing a mod rewrite. Remember the mod rewrite from a couple lectures back that's taking the addresses and it's realizing that this is the controller that we have to do, that we are dealing with. So uh, the cake PHP file or the index.php file within cake PHP realizes that addresses is the controller and it sends that request to the addresses controller. 
Okay, so far so good. So we just defined the addresses controller. That's all we that's all we did, but that's all that was necessary because all of Cake PHP's built-in functions allow to allow it to talk to the model, which is address, the address model, which then communicates with the database automatically, returns all of the necessary data, and then that is passed back to the controller, and that data is sent to the view, which is again done automatically for us. We've done very, very little, but all, but all it's doing is contacting the database and, um, and displaying the information for us in a predefined way. So yes. I'm assuming this is a default view since just reads the database and just spills spill, spill the stuff <coughs> under the page. Oh yeah, this is default view. If you go home, download Cake PHP and try it, it will happen there as so well. If you, wanted, if you wanted to represent the data in some other fashion, you have, you have to create your own view, basically, correct? Yes, if you want to, yes, you have to modify the, the CSS file and the views if you want to present the data in a different fashion. We're actually going to go over that in just a minute. So yes? Somewhere in a configuration file, you've told it the name of the database and the username and password, and that's all? And it's on the database table automatically? Yes, somewhere, yes, there's a configuration file where I defined the, the database server's local host and then gave it the database name as Dan Allen underscore lectures or something like that. My username, my password for that database. And it contacts the database table, or it connects to the database table according to the name of the model. So again, you'd have to look up the conventions, but it's, it's basically, it's address, I think it is, for the table. And so you name it the appropriate name for the table as well, and then the model's automatically able to contact the table for that. There's a few more, okay, yes. <laughs> so it's only a one table to one controller. You can have it connect to multiple tables, but that's kind of beyond the scope of what I'll be talking about. But yes, there, there are ways to do joins and, and more complex database queries. Yes? Uh, if you want to modify the database, in other words, are you creating the table for like PHP or are you doing it through Cake? If I want to modify the database, so um, I could modify the database right now through PHP my admin, and if I refresh the page, Cake would query the, the table and realize that there's been a change and would show me the, the most recent update to the table. So when you, you created the table through like, PHP? Yeah, I created the table separately before I, I even dealt with Cake. I did it through PHP my admin, just a standard table creation according to the, the conventions that they said, ID, the created, the modified, fields and, and my own fields, the first name, last name, etc. Yes? So, as I said, this is a default view, so the URL is the, actually the, the, it's the controller name, right, addresses. So if you wanted a different view with that URL change, you have to basically specify the view. If you want it, file. okay, so if you want a different view, does the URL change? Yes, it does, and, and uh, a couple examples later, we'll, we'll see the, how we can deal with multiple views, such as an edit view, uh, the, uh, an ad view, et cetera. And also just one thing. So the dispatcher, I don't know if you're going to talk about it, or not, but how is that fit in this? The dispatcher isn't really important to us. All it does, it's, it's just the intermediary that takes the URL. So in this case, cake3 slash addresses, and says, OK, addresses must be the controller. And it passes the request over to that controller. Is it a PHP file? What is it? Yeah, it's a PHP file. Well, Cake PHP is written in, in PHP. So there are ways to pass it arguments, and you do that uh, at the end of the URL with slashes. So if addresses slash edit, for example, uh, would send a, a particular variable to the controller, which would have some particular modification. But we'll, we'll get into this in just a minute. Basically, the, in the MVC uh, framework, Cake PHP itself is the dispatcher. Yes, Cake you're, PHP you're itself is the dispatcher. The dispatcher. No, no, no. You don't deal. No, no. KHP, no. Cake PHP writes all of this stuff for you. They they do the basic MVC framework. They have the dispatcher that deals with all of these, um, all of these commands and arguments that are passed over to your controller. So as long as you uh, adhere to the conventions of Cake PHP, it'll do all of this stuff automatically for you. And it's I know it's really difficult to get your mind wrapped around, but I hope that as I go through some some of the examples, it'll start to come together and make a little bit of sense. Okay, so. All right, this is great for scaffolding, but we don't have a lot of control now over what is shown to us. And so we may want to create 
we, want, we may want to take down the scaffolding and create our own logic now for cake PHP. So that's exactly what happens in, oops, in the next version, cake 4. So all of this source code will go online. And so this is a modified version that shows me um, just a view that I wanted to, to have it displayed. So with this, you have to modify the um, you have to modify the controller and the models, and so let's take a look at those. Okay, so this time, as you'll see, we have, we now have, we have added, in addition to our controllers and our models, we've added views as well, and so we'll just go through these one at a time. So let's now take a look at what our new controllers looks like. So this, again, is addresses controller extends app controller. There's no surprises there, or there shouldn't be at least. This is all the same. So <clears throat> we defined the name of it as addresses, and we removed the scaffolding. Okay, so now we are doing everything on our own, uh, just with CakePHP's help. So now we have, we define a function called index. And this is required by all controllers. When you had the scaffolding up, the index was defined for you automatically. And the index is what it sounds like. It's the index of that particular controller. If you just go to cake4 slash addresses slash, it goes to the index of that particular controller. Okay? So what it does is it, it calls a method called set. And in it, it contacts... All right, so let's break this part one part at a time. This latter part is that it contacts what is address. Anybody remember what address is? The model, that's right. So it contacts the address model, and then it asks the model to find all records. Okay, pretty easy. And then what this, um, this set method does is it creates a new array called addresses with the results of that particular find query. So all the controller has done now is created a new array called addresses and in it it has put all of the data from the address model. Okay, so far so good. So now the model or the controller knows that it needs to pass this data on to the view. So in order to do that it looks for the view called index. So this again is another part that Cake PHP does for you automatically. No, what, whatever method you define here, so function index here, it will look for that particular view file, and in that view file, you will be able to define how this data is arranged. So in the views file, oops, we have an index. Dot, it's called an index.thtml, and that's just because it's a template file. But all it is is a PHP file that's missing the stuff from the top and the bottom because Cake PHP does has a templating system built in, and we can define how we want this data to be arranged. So this should all look familiar to you. So my contacts, then I create a table with uh, some columns, ID, first name, last name created, and then I just loop through each of the addresses. Oops. So here there's a for each loop for each addresses as address. And then all I do is I just echo out the name of the field within that particular address. So it's very easy then to just show or to show all of the data from this particular uh, query. Yes? So if you wanted to name this file index 2.thtml or whatever, mm -hmm. um, so the function ends up in, would have been index, index 2? Yes, if you want to name this file index2.thtml, you have to go into your controller and create a new method called function index2, and then you have to pass the appropriate data from your controller into, into the thtml file. Right, there was nothing there in the URL, and, but if we, got, if we went to addresses slash index, it should it should load up this page because that's what it's doing. If, if, no, if no arguments are passed, it assumes an index, but you can pass it in, an argument and then it will open up that particular view with the data passed to it by the controller. Yes? So sticking to the convention is very important because presumably you don't want to have index 2. You just 
want to have it kind of be in addresses and you get a listing of addresses or if it's a but if it's a view um, of Dan, then you want it to be view slash seven. And then it right. gives you the correct view. And right. You wouldn't, you wouldn't wanna you wouldn't really wanna <coughs> Yeah, you generally wouldn't want to mess around with the names too much. That's right. So you would want to try to stick to convention, but you can change them. And certainly, this is only of limited use, especially for many of your own applications where you have many different views for your data. So you may want to create new views and name them something different. And that's when this becomes important. And certainly, you'll notice that the ID is a link here. So ID7 is a link. And notice that the URL is very, very tiny but it says cake4 slash addresses slash view slash seven. So it may be somewhat confusingly named in retrospect, but what it does is it tells the controller that it wants to look at a page called view and it passes it an ID of seven. From there, what do you think the controller would do? Well, before, before it contacts the view, what, what does it have to do? That's right. It has, yep, exactly. So it contacts the model and it says, I want all of the records related to ID 7. And then it comes back with that data. Then that data is passed over into the view.thtml, which is then displayed here on screen. So we can see all of this in action. So under the addresses controller, if I continue scrolling down, what you didn't see before was a view function, and in it is an argument of the ID. So from there, the ID is set in the model. So this address ID is equal to the ID that's passed into it. And then we set a variable or an array called data with the result of that query. So the query in this case, oops. The query in this case is just contacts the model. So this address and then read. Yes. So how does it know that seven is the variable name ID? And that is just done, um, again, by convention. So you can see that the URL is addresses slash view slash seven. So that means that addresses is the name of the controller. View is the name of the method and the, and the view file. And then the subsequent slashes and, and values are the arguments for that. So if we put a, a second argument here, we would have to add a second argument into the controller to be able to accept it and parse that data somehow. So this yes. is an ID because your view method says it's an ID. This is an ID. Yes, it's an ID so could, because my view method is, says it's an ID. Down there instead and rewrite your view method to look up first name. Right. Well, there's no, as you'll notice, there's, there's no checking going on. So if I put but something like Dan here, it's not going to return anything because it's searching the IDs for Dan. But if you Dan. implemented your view method differently, you could have your view method look up first name and this would work. Oh, certainly. You could certainly implement it differently such that instead of looking up by ID, you could look it up by first name or by last name or, or any number so of fields. ID is something you've decided, not that PHP has. Yeah, I, I decided ID. Yeah. Yes. So yes. Oh yes. Right. No, that's that's exactly what Cake PHP does because of the mod rewrite that it does. It takes the the very the very first thing after the Cake um, file or the, the Cake folder is the controller. So in this case, addresses. After that, then is the method or the the view that you want to look. In this case, view, and then every every uh, slash after that indicates a new argument for that particular function. So if our function allowed for multiple arguments, then, so for example, uh, maybe what we wanted to look it up by first name and last name, we could do Dan slash Armandaris. However, this wouldn't work because it's not expecting two arguments, first of all, and the one argument that it is expecting is the ID. Yes? So is it rewriting this into a get request? Or like, what's wrong with 
Yeah, it's rewriting it into a get request, but it's. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's doing. Yeah, it's rewriting it to the question mark, all that stuff. But it's behind the scenes. We don't see it, and it's not that particular request isn't important to us. Any more questions? Okay. Oh yeah, you can certainly use cake PHP for industrial strength. Uh, yeah, uh, I think one of the, the most famous ones that they love to quote is the Mozilla add-ons web page. They use cake PHP in order to view, to show all of their add-ons that exist for it. Um, let's see. I think they have at the bottom of their web page a list of some of the places that use cake PHP. So, they call it Just Baked, so Mozilla add-ons, Scratch by MIT, Yale Daily News, The Onion Store, Nose Rub, Foamy, Twimbler. And it's, it's actually very, very powerful such that you can, you can do authentication with it and you can, uh, there's a lot of verification options for credit cards and such, so it'll actually, it's actually a lot more powerful than this very basic application that we're creating right now, but baby steps for now, so. Okay. So let's move on to the next cake version. Oh, I didn't show you the, um, the view for the view.thtml. So remember that the controller passed all of the data to this view via the data array. And so all we're doing here is we've just created a very basic XHTML file that just echoes out that data straight from um, the controller. So data, address, comments, phone, email, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, next one. So now, what's different? Yep, there's an add contact. So what has to have changed for this? It's another controller. Not another controller. So it's, well, it's another method in the same controller. And we probably would have to have another view for this add method. And this default, this index view right here, had to have been changed in order to incorporate the link. But that's pretty much it. So if we click on the add contact, you notice that the URL at the very bottom is what we would expect, addresses slash add. So it's sending over the, it's, it's requesting the add method from the uh, addresses controller. And from there, it brings up a form. So let's break this down. Five. Okay, so again we have our controllers, our models, and our views. So this is all the same as before. We have the index method, the view method, and now we have a new one called the add method. So function add, you'll, you'll notice that there, it takes no arguments at all. Let me see if I can make this bigger. Okay, so the add view does a number of things at once. So it not only shows you the form, but when you submit the form, it posts to itself. So it's exactly what you would expect from a form that looks like that. So if I just add a new person, David, mail in, uh, another phone, save. So now it says, uh, you'll notice that at the very top, the URL says addresses slash add, so it posted to itself, and it just gives me a link that says your contact has been saved. If I click on that link, it brings me back to the index view, which shows me all of the records in my database, and it's exactly as we would expect. It shows us the new one as well. Yes? Uh, create the add view. Mm -hmm. There's some utility that allows you to create the beginnings of this chunk of code. So yes and no. Um, there's something called bake that will do a lot of this stuff for you, and we're actually going to talk about that a lot later. But um, in general, uh, not really. Besides, besides bake, not really. You have to uh, 
know what to do with the data. And uh, it's somewhat simple as, as you look at it, but it's, it's almost as if learning a different language just because you have to learn Cake PHP's conventions. I mean, you don't literally have to learn a different language because you know PHP. It's just that you have to learn what Cake PHP expects um, in order for you to perform certain tasks. And these rudimentary ones, adding and editing and all of, all of this stuff, once, once you learn these, it becomes much more intuitive what you're trying to do with the data. And then you can modify it more easily from there. So um, to answer, well, let's see, to take a look at what happens here, let's just take a look at the controller again. And this is the add function. And so remember that the data was posted to itself. And what Cake PHP does is it converts all of the post data and puts it into a data array. So what we're saying is if the posted data exists, so if this data address is not empty, then what we're going to do is that means that some data was sent and we need to try to save this data. Okay, so you would do what you would expect. You would contact the model. So you say this address and then save and you just pass it the data that you want to be saved. In this case, it's pretty easy. It's all done for you. Again, you just pass it the post data that was sent to the controller. So this will return either true or false, depending on whether it completed successfully or not. If it did, then this very bottom line is run. It says your contact has been saved. So one second. So flash is a method that's part of the, con the larger app controller class that does just what you saw at the very beginning. It just, get, it just flashes a message, and from there, it'll, it can be a link to something else. So at the very end of this flash, uh, this flash location here, you'll notice that we're just going to, after, after it shows this message, we just want it to be a link back to the default view, so the address is controller. This could be to any URL that we want, but we just, it makes sense after it's been added to send the user back to the default view. There's a question. Sorry, did you have a question? Yes, that the text at the top function add, that's your choice, it's whatever you want, but it has to be consistent. So this has to be called add, the view has to be called add, all of your links have to refer to address slash add, et cetera. But as soon as, assuming all of that is consistent, Cake takes care of the rest for you. You don't have to. Now, the save method, this is method that already exists in the original class that you extended earlier. Yes, so the save method exists in the original class that we extended earlier. So this is part of the uh, app model class as part of Cake PHP. And th there's an API for Cake PHP, as you would expect, and you can see all of the methods and all of the classes that exist. So you would know what methods exist when you, whenever you extend a model class or whenever you extend a controller class. You would know what's available to you, what arguments it takes, what uh, arguments or what is what value is returned, etc. And then you could build your logic from there. Yes. So in this case, we have just one table, right? Yes, just one table. Where are we associating the table with this process? So, it's so the table. We don't. Um, the magic of Cake PHP is that we don't care that it's a table. We do all of our um, data instructions based on the model itself. So the model, when we're looking at the model, that's when we care about whether or not it's a a database or an XML file or what have you, but uh, it's abstracted such that all we have to do is tell the model that we want to save this data. The model then communicates with the database in this case and it does the appropriate SQL statements in order to save this data. However, realize that you can have mo models for many other types of data stores such as XML files as well, in which case you would still use the same method but the implementation would be different. It's just the nitty-gritty details in that case that are a little bit different. But it still has to know, I mean, whatever your data store might be, XML file, people I don't care about. The controller doesn't have to know. The controller doesn't care what kind of, of data store it is. It just knows that it wants to save this information to the, the model. 
the model is a class that deals with that aspect. It deals with the actual saving of the data. So only the model cares about what kind of data it is. This is the abstraction that's so important. This is what's separating the logic from our actual data storage and separating the logic from our, our view as well, is that just by contacting this model, the, uh, the controller will trust that the model will know how to deal with the data, know what will know how to save that data to a database or to an XML file or, or what have you. Yes? So I'm assuming the flash method actually makes the text link displayed as a link? Is that right? Yes. Yeah, yeah the, the flash method, all it does is it, it's just, um, I suppose you could think of it as a special view where all it does is just shows this method, or it, it just shows this text as a link to slash addresses. Okay. All right, so we added a view to it, and that was the add view. So we should probably take a look at that one as well. So this isn't anything surprising either. Um, so we're actually going to skip the top couple lines for now. But all of this stuff is what you would expect. So we just have a form, and uh, we have all of the text in it. So, um, But there's something new about this. And this is one of the classes that CakePHP makes available to you the HTML helper class. So there's a number of helper classes available, including HTML, AJAX, uh, there's uh, email sending helper class. I think there's a whole bunch of classes that help you just get stuff done. It, it, again, it helps you not worry about the specifics of it, and it just lets you code directly. So um, right here, all we're doing is we're just asking the helper class to send or to uh, output the URL for addresses slash add. We put the result of that into the action attribute of the form element at the very top. So all this is doing is returning, if I add contact and if I look at the source, look at the very top, we look at the, uh, let's see, the form action, we see that CakePHP knows that it's living in Cake5, and it's added that for us automatically. So it's just created this URL just from that HTML helper class. So this can make things a lot easier for us, and it certainly does, especially when you want to output a lot of form elements. So here, another, another of the great ones is input as part of the HTML helper class. So input is a method in the HTML helper class where we just give it the, the name of the data. So this is address slash first name. So first name is the name of the field that we want to update. And then we tell what uh, attributes we want as part of that specific input field. And so again, I'll, I'll have to refer you to the API for specifics, but we're, we're saying that we want the maximum size of this to be 10, which if we were to go back th to uh, the SQL database, we would see that I defined the maximum size of the first name field to be 10 characters long. So we're just hard coding basically the maximum length into it. Yes? You haven't told it what kind of input element. No, I haven't told it what kind of input element. It assumes uh, there's a way that you can, um, so let's see, you, you can change the type of input elements depending on the uh, the method. So input is just a regular text input, text area is a text area, and submit is just the submit button. Yes? So, uh, email is the field name in the, in the, in the uh, model, correct? E email is the field name in the database, yes. Database. Yes. Uh, so here it creates an input a type of text. Mm -hmm. Um, I actually don't know the answer to that question. So it looks like what it does is it outputs the name of the input field to what you pass into it. So in this case, it's, it seems to be literally defining um, a particular array. So in the data array, if you remember, this is this was that data array that was referenced as the post. Uh, if we if we went back to the the processor page, and in it there's an address. Um, 
an address array that contains each of these field names as a value in it. I had to input the, the label of the field. I had to know that my database name was, yeah, I typed this in myself. So I said, okay, I know that in email, I want to have an input type of email that is this long, yes. Right. Do you actually have to write the, the form validation, or does it do that for you? The last example is form validation. Oh. And it's, there's no form validation built in like this, but it's very easy to add form validation to uh, this framework that exists. Yes? Uh, in, in the output, I said there's like 0 equals 0. Um, right. Those so I assume this is just output from cake PHP. So these zero attributes and these one attributes. Uh, it looks like it's just output from cake PHP for some reason. So it must be, um, this is not valid. unless I, no, it's not valid, it, you smell. So what I may have done wrong was uh, when I wrote this array that's here to pass it specific attributes. So here where it says size or array size and 10, it may be misinterpreting that. I have to go back into the API and see if it actually requires an array in this case. Um, but I may have sent it the wrong data, which is probably why it's becoming invalid XHTML. I assume you can uh, add other arbitrary valid attributes like uh, event handlers and whatnot. You can add your own valid attributes such as event handlers, but um, there are helpers for JavaScript and for Ajax and such. So if you wanted some sort of JavaScript handler or, or something like that, then you should look into those handlers to see if there's a better way to do it than just writing it, hard coding it directly into this particular method. Did I see another question? No, it's, it's not adding a label to the input field. That, that would probably have to be an attribute that we define ourselves and have, that would allow CakePHP to output it. But it, it looks like the default input method um, does not output a label. But it does output an ID, I suppose. So you could use that instead of a, of a label. Well, I mean, that would be one of those convenient, that would be convenient since the label has to say label for and then reference the ID for you, you were, where you would just, it would, it would come up with the ID name by itself, and it would, it would create the label and automatically give the correct, you know, for value and so forth. I don't think I understand what you mean. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, just in general, I'm sort of, at the moment, struggling with why writing this KPHP code is better than just writing the HTML, you know? So... Because it doesn't seem to be any At the moment, like, these input things doesn't, doesn't seem any more efficient. Right, so as it is now, it doesn't look like it's helping you out very much, and that's true, but um, for much greater, much larger applications that are very complex, this can help abstract it quite a bit more um, than what we are used to. And certainly as, as we add in validation, that will help us reduce the amount of typing that we have to do a great deal. So, okay, yes, one more question. Just looking at the, the attributes it's generating, it seems like you you have to go through through this step of letting it generate the HTML in order for all the names to be right for it to automatically handle the uh, the post. Yeah, you have to let it right. You have to let it handle writing the attributes so that it's it will be able to correctly the handle them. That it's going to the right, that's right. But you do have control over the attributes that are sent to it. And uh, so, like, uh, so back here in. Um, the very first argument to this input method is the name of this input field, and so we're defining it explicitly. So we can change that. We would just have to change, again, all of the other things in the, con well, just the controller as well to, to make sure that we do it. So, okay, we need to take a five minute break, and when we come back, we'll keep talking about this. I think I noticed that a lot of you had uh, 
sugar crashes at the end of by the end of the last hour. So uh, we'll just try to try a little bit harder to make cake even more appetizing. Haha. <laughs> okay. So this is cake six. It's a slight modification. As you can see, we're slowly building up to our scaffolding. The amount of uh, of 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 work that we had in just by declaring that scaffold variable. And so we, you see that we have now, in addition to the add contact, a couple of actions. So we have a view and an edit. So a view is really just the copy paste from this view code over here at the very far left with the ID where you can click on a view and it passes over um, into the addresses controller. Uh, it requests the, the view method and then ID number eight. And from that we get all of the information for that particular view. But also now we have, we're adding an edit action. And so from here we can very easily modify any of this information that we want and when we save it we receive something that's very similar to this to that add code from before where it says it, it gives that flash which says your contact has been added or in this case your contact, your contact has been updated. We can see that the changes reflect in the, the default view right away. And so you're saying, oh man, this is going to be another bunch of code and it's going to be very difficult and, and confusing, but you can actually copy paste a lot of the code from the previous view. So let's see, the very first thing that we have to have is a new view for it, and that is the edits view. As soon as it comes up here. Okay, so let me make this a little bit bigger again. So in this view, we have, it's very, very similar to the ad view from before. It's frankly just copy pasted from the ad view where the only difference now is the URL at the top. We're posting it to edit rather than add. So we're just telling the controller that we are doing something very different. We're just doing an edit method rather than an add method, but all of the code is the same and that's all that I really had to do. Well, I think is there anything? No. That's really all that's changed is that edit. Yes? So is the edit uh, another controller? Edit is not another controller. It's another uh, method within the address's controller. Okay. I'm just trying to figure out how the, the database gets updated. Oh, we're going we're gonna to look at the logic right now because uh, how does, so the question was how does the database get updated and again that is the job of the controller to handle for all of this particular logic. So we have our index function is before, our view function, our add function, and now at the very bottom here we have edit. So there's something that I want to point out first, and that is that right here it says ID is equal to null. Anybody have idea what that is for, what that might mean? Default value. Yeah, default value. So in this case, if no variable is passed as ID, it's just going to default as null. Otherwise, if a variable is passed, it's going to use that instead. So in essence, you're making this argument an optional argument, which can be pretty useful not only for Cake, but your own PHP um, files yourself. So then this is very, very similar to what we had before. So let's see. At the very top, we first check to see if the posted data exists. So if the posted data is empty, then what we're going to do is set the ID of the model to the ID that was passed in and it's going to read the data from it to populate the form. Okay? So as you recall the difference, one of the main differences between add, which by clicking on it you see that the form is blank, and edit, where notice the URL in this case it's addresses slash edit slash eight. So we are passing the ID into the edit method. We click on edit. The controller receives that ID. It sets the method to that particular ID and it reads the data and then it populates the form with that data. So this simplifies again a lot of the information so you don't have to do value equals and then echo out the result of the database. It's all done for you automatically. Okay, so now let's say that we've made a few changes and we click on save. So now we're going to have data in the post array, which is actually that data array. And if we take a look here, so there is this if empty. Now this is a case where all of the comments get in the way of, of the code. Otherwise, data has not been posted, probably because 
or let's see, the data has been posted, excuse me, probably because the form has been submitted, then all we do is we just save. We just send the data to the save method in um, the address um, in the address model. And the save method knows that it's an update rather than a new one, and it will do the flash. And so again, this is all abstracted from us, so the model knows if it's uh, saving a new uh, record versus updating an old one just by the ID that exists. Most likely, we can infer that the ID that exists in this data array, because, and here I remember the one other modification that was made to edit, the edit.thtml, you'll notice that we echo out the ID as a hidden input field. So this is, we didn't do in the add, but this way, when the form is sent, we are sending the ID back to the controller, and the controller in turn sends that ID over to the model, and the model says, okay, this save must be an update rather than um, a new one. And that's because the ID is, is a primary key and the model knows that it is a primary key. And again, because of convention. The field name is ID, so the model realizes that an ID, um, an ID field must be a primary key, and so therefore you will be able to use that to update it. So all the rest is what you would expect. Uh, whoops, this is for the wrong part. So edit. All right. One second. So then, yeah, so then edit. We send the, we use the save method as part of the address model and pass into it the data from the form. Pretty easy. And all we, in just 30 seconds, we've now added the ability to edit a record in this particular data field. Uh, yes. So in what, which scenario would ID would be null? Would which scenario would ID be null? That would be the scenario where the data is posted. Because um, the ID is null, or ID is sent some data when, when there is a GET request because of the addresses slash edit slash ID number. So in this case, uh, edit slash eight. In that case, that's a GET request. So the, the variable um, ID is from the GET request and posted into, or put, not posted, put into the ID argument up there. When it's posted, then that ID is not is remains null because there is not it has not been requested via get. Yes. So um, flash basically says ignore whatever view you would normally go to and just show this thing. Right. So it, it says to ignore. Well, it, it says to ignore specifically the edit view because we are in the edit method. So it says to ignore the edit.thtml view and to just output a link that says this and goes to back to the addresses index. So the, the case that has the flash just shows the flash. The case that doesn't does what it would normally do, which is find a view that's called the same thing as the controller method that it's just called. Right. So in the case where there is, where there is not the flash, it defaults to the, the view that's, whose name is found by the name of the method at the top. OK. So. More nods as we, as we go along. So I think this is, I hope this is making a little bit more sense. So let's add one more thing to this now, the ability to delete a record. So this would be cake seven. Whoops. All right, so here now we have a new action at the far right of the table. We have view edit and now the new one is delete. And so check this out. Okay, I'll delete. Now it actually brings up a JavaScript. Are you sure? I click OK, and now the data was deleted. So probably as you're looking at this, it's starting to, you're starting to realize some of these things. So this page right here is probably a flash, and it's probably just given by a link that goes back to slash addresses. So how does this work? Ideas? Yes. Yes, I've added a delete method to the controller class, and that's really it. But there's, this is a special case, because I didn't actually go to a separate file. I, there wasn't a separate view for it. So I, in this case, I didn't need a delete view. I only had a new delete method in the class. And if we look at the URL for the link here, you can see that it's 
cake 7 slash addresses, which is the, contro the controller slash delete, which is the method slash 7. So we are telling the delete, uh, the delete method in the addresses controller what we want to delete. So let's take a look at this one. All right. So again, we have our controller. So we'll take a look at the views. And you'll notice that it's the same views that we've had before. There's add.thtml, edit, index, and view, but there's not a delete one. It's not really necessary in this case. Um, so what, what is important to us, though, is the addresses. The addresses controller, that is. So scroll all the way down to the bottom. Everything else is the same. And it's two lines of code, or three, if you want to if you want to count the function declaration. So function delete, which is what we would expect based on the arguments in the URL. If this address, so we're asking the model to run the delete method or the DEL method given the particular ID. From there, if it's successful, then we just flash the user, well, so to speak, and say contact ID number was successfully deleted. Yes. You don't put delete in, if you don't put the ID in there, does it delete the whole table? I don't know. I didn't try it. <laughs> I, guess, I guess we could try it right now. We could add another contact and then just try to access. All right. So this time, get OU. All right. So test that, whatever. All right. So there's no data validation, as you can see. All right. So now, instead of having addresses slash delete slash a specific ID number, we'll just try to replicate this by going to addresses slash delete and not pass it any data. Let's see if it, okay. So it, it gives us an error because um, a view with delete is, or so it's expecting a delete view with uh, no arguments to be, to be found. But in this case, it's not found. There is no delete method that allows for zero arguments. So this fails. So we could, I suppose we could edit the, the code to, to verify how it would work. But um, this is a local copy rather than a server copy. So I don't want to drop my table anyway. <laughs> OK. So what's the obvious thing that's missing from all of this stuff? The JavaScript question. Oh, yeah, the JavaScript question. OK, that's a good point. So I should show. So there is. Um, <clears throat> So in order to show that um, all of these additional links, we just have to modify the index view. And in the index view, all we've been doing is just adding on additional links. And again, this is done with the use of the HTML helper class. And you'll see that we are now adding an HTML, or we are using a link method in the HTML. It's going to be called delete, and it's going to reference addresses slash delete slash the ID when this is just a for each loop, so this shouldn't be anything surprising. And then um, <clears throat> this third argument right here are any specific attributes I think that you want to send to that particular link. In this case, we don't want anything special, so null, but um, there is the fourth argument is just a JavaScript question that you can, that CakePHP will automatically ask. It'll automatically insert all of the code for you if you want to have one. So in this case, we ask, do you really want to delete this? So it makes it easy to add that JavaScript question. And this is just some built-in functionality to CakePHP in order to verify if the user wanted to do this. So besides the JavaScript, what's the obvious thing that's been missing? Validation, validation yes. So let's take a look at validation. and. Validation in Cake is actually really easy to do. So um, let's say that I want to add a contact. Uh, let's see. I'll try with an invalid email address. So bad email, with a valid phone, and I submit it. It's actually going to tell me now that a valid email is required. And so this is typical form validation that you would expect. It's nothing fancy, nothing Ajaxy or JavaScripty. It's just a regular form submission. And this is done with the help now 
finally modifying that model, the address model. So let's take a look at this. And you might be surprised, but all we do in order to define validation for particular sets in the model is we just define a validate array. So there's a new variable called validate, and in it we put an array of what the name of the fields are, so first name, last name, email, and phone, and in each of these I want to define specifically what I want, how I want it to be valid. So the first name is kind of generic, I just want it to be not empty. The last name I just want it to be not empty. Email is a valid email, so no longer do I need this complicated 30 page long reg regular expression. And phone is just a valid number, so it's not going to allow for fancy parentheses or dashes or anything like this, but it will actually just allow to enter a phone number. So now this is actually going to validate the form. So if some data doesn't match this particular validation, those save methods, remember from the, uh, the, the controller, will fail. So this is all of those times where we had that if statement, if model uh, arrow save and then we save the data. If that is true, then we showed the flash, but we never had an else statement. So that's all we have to do here is we actually, okay, so else, let's see. It's probably even simpler. It's even simpler than that. So we just make sure that, for example, in this edit, we just make sure that the save had completed. However, the save will not complete if the form doesn't validate for some reason. So only if this is valid will the user get the flash message. Okay, so now though, going back to the view for edit, for example, um, we now see that we just have one extra line of code underneath the input, and that is using the HTML helper requesting an error message. So if there is an error message based on the validation of this field, it's going to, so this is the field name that is going to be validated. If it has an error message, it's going to show you this error. So first name required, last name required, you must enter a valid email address. So now all we've had to do in, in order to add in validation is one line of code for each field and just tell in the model what we want to be validated, how we want the data to be validated. Yes, is there? Uh, just no? Just one question. Is that already oh. defined or do you have to define those criteria? Those criteria are defined um, in, PH, in Cake PHP 1.1. So those are pretty much the extent of the, uh, the validation options in Cake PHP 1.1. But 1.2 has many more powerful versions of it, but that's, that's, the beta, that's still in beta right now. And they can do, they can validate email addresses, phone numbers uh, in international and US style, and email addresses, credit card numbers, all sorts of form validations. Um, but for right now, this is all that's necessary for, for us. You can input your own uh, verification with a regular expression rather than putting in that, um, uh, the, uh, the constant that said uh, valid email, for example, you can just enter in a regular expression string and it will validate against that string. Yes? Oh, okay, yeah, so you do have many options in, in CakePHP besides those built-in ones to, to allow it. And um, like I said, Cake CakePHP 1.2 has many more um, variations of, of validation where you can even mix and match uh, strange combinations of logic for the validation, but again, that's kind of beyond the scope of all of this. So, okay, so with that, with just, I mean, relatively few lines of code, we were able to get all of this up and running and the ability to add, edit, delete specific records, view all the records, view one specific record, validate all of the inputs in a particular record, uh, and just with, I mean, well, in an hour and a half, so to speak, of, of time, but really in relative ease, so long as you remember all of the conventions that 
Cake, Cake PHP uses in order to get all of this done. Yes. Sorry, I think you already mentioned that this is beyond the scope of doing that. But we have seen the single level operations of create activity for how complex it is to have multiple joins and query and scope procedures and stuff like that. How complex is it to do multiple joins and queries and such? So I imagine that you would have to modify the model in that case to, to tell it specifically how to how to deal with it. But in terms of complexity, I'm not, I'm not sure. You'd have to look at the cake manual and, and the API to see how that's done. You avoid some of that by creating views in MySQL so that you'd be accessing the view, the same you'd be accessing the table, so. So creating a view in MySQL so that you'd be accessing the view? Or do you so, so I mean, the view would be made up of like a joint two tables. So to cake PHP, you would just be seeing the single thing, which is View, not a table, but you know, it doesn't make no difference. Yes, well, I think, so I think you, well, I mean, you can do that if you would like, but I think Cake PHP does actually have um, certain model classes that allow, that have built in support for joins specifically between two, um, between two tables, but again, you'd have to take a look at the documentation for specific implementation schemes. Yes? So um, I didn't show you the databases file, but you actually set arrays um, of databases. So there's a, you can connect to one database for development. You can connect to another database for testing and a, and a third one for production level. And, I, and since it's an array of databases, I believe that you can define multiple databases there. But again, I'll have to defer to the manual. Yes? Uh, how easy is it to add in hooks for doing styling, like throwing in class. <coughs> how easy is it to? CSS. How easy is it to <laughs> add in hooks for CSS and such? It's very easy. It's very easy to modify the templates for Cake PHP. Um, they're all within the the directory that's that you download, and you can do, you can modify all of the templates and define them to look exactly how you would like them to look. So. Mm -hmm. does, that have, does that already have a class that you could then just, you know, use in a CSS file to, to, make, it look, to make it be green instead of red? So in this case, so you're asking about this um, invalid output error message, like whether it has a class or not. That's a good question for this. Let's see. Um, invalid. Didn't it say invalid? It's invalid. I'm sorry? Oh, valid. Okay, so yeah, it says it's div class error underscore message. So it would be very easy then to modify um, the CSS for that and change the the style and the color of that of that error message. There's also a form error class on the previous element. Yep, there's a form error class on the on the input element itself as well. So you could probably make that show. Color. Yeah, you can make it show up in red or put a red border around it, something like that. So whatever you would like to do. So it is, Cake PHP is very modular. They have put a lot of thought into this. So um, certainly this is very, very simple, very basic, what I'm, what I'm showing you here. And what you're able to do with it is, is really quite powerful. Yes? How long has it been in existence? How long has it been in, in existence? Um, that I don't know. I think it's a couple of years. I don't, I don't know. It's at least one year. Because they are showing all over their website on this day, um, a couple years ago, some guy created the first version of Cake PHP. Oh, cake, CakePHP.org. I think it's on the right sidebar here. Let's see. I don't. So it's after three years. It says so. We can infer that it's at least three years old at this point. So it's it is quite mature. And uh, though I showed you, like I said, Cake PHP 1.1. Do take a look at the beta release of 1.2, where they have really added in a lot of interesting features. Um, let's see, I have a list here. So, um, so in 1.2, they have more validation caching support, which is, is nice. Um, enhanced console scripts for automation. So you could uh, have a cron job, for example, that outputs transactions every so often. Um, you, it'll, it has built-in support for RSS feeds. Authentication and ACLs, uh, so access control lists for uh, 
if you have people who have staff access to the website versus uh, user access, for example. Very, very many other things are, are built in into um, 1.2. They also have more helpers as well. And so this slide here shows you all of the um, relevant uh, information for CakePHP. So cakephp.org, cake you can find all of this stuff, but the links to API, the API reference and the manual are, are up here as well. And one of the things that I glossed over was something called Bake. And if you download Cake and you just create that very simple scaffold uh, class or the scaffold controller and, and uh, model that I showed you very, very early on in the first example, what you can do is use Bake and it will actually be able to um, output all of the code or a lot of this code that we just did ourselves in the past hour and a half automatically. So it would basically output the code from the scaffolding and then you, from there you can modify it rather than having to build all of this stuff from scratch. So uh, if you're saying, oh, why did you waste my time for the last hour and a half? Well, it's just to show you how all of this works and why it works the way it does. But this is even a very useful tip, of, even without knowing Bake or CakePHP or anything. If you're on a command line and you do PHP or a command line uh, for a Unix machine that has PHP installed or uh, specifically CS75, if you're logged in, you do PHP space dash F, um, you can run a specific PHP file directly there so that you can see the output in the console, or you can change it to dash R and in quotes put in some very basic PHP code. So maybe you want to see how a particular function would uh, behave given some input. Then you can just run that input and it will give you the output on the console itself. So this is a very handy way of, of debugging without needing to create a PHP page and, and upload it to your public HTML and get the permissions right and all that stuff, you can actually modify it directly there. Uh, yes? So, uh, I understand it's, it's quite simple, <coughs> but just highlight some of the downsides of the framework. Some of the downsides of Cake PHP. So, the frameworks in general. Right? So, um, <clears throat> well, I think in, for the frameworks in general, that's more difficult because I think that this sort of model is good practice in general to be able to abstract uh, the view of your data versus or from the, the logic of the data versus the, the data storage itself. I think it's very good to abstract all of that so that if you need to make a change to either the logic or to the data store at some point, you don't have to go through lots and lots of lines of code for it. Um, let's see, in terms of these very public frameworks, I imagine that you could maybe make an argument like well, a question that was brought up earlier was um, about the security of these things. If the code is out there and someone can look at the code and, and be able to find um, vulnerabilities much more quickly than if, say, they were obfuscated behind uh, a private PHP file. But um, it's, un I mean, in that case, I guess they could do some sort of a mass attack to multiple cake PHP sites, but I imagine that with dozens of people looking at this code and making sure that it's working, it's, it's, as long as you validate all of your inputs, okay, you should be reasonably fine. So. So what the dash R option, what does that stand for? I'm sorry? Dash R, you said. Oh, so the difference, so PHP dash F runs a file. PHP dash R just runs code that you've quoted in the, as an argument to it. Uh, so you'd have to use double quotes, and then you could say echo random 0 to 100 or something and just to see what the result of that would be. Uh, yes, sorry. <laughs> in something like Project 3, though, at least in my Project 3, there was business logic really in the JavaScript. I mean, the controller, the, the, the model view controller pattern doesn't quite... Right, so when you're talking about... Right, so when you have uh, very JavaScript heavy applications, you do have the problem of code that's running client side versus uh, server side, but you probably could apply this MVC model to not only the client side code, but the server side code. It's just going to be a little bit messy because you have lots and lots of code to have to deal with at once. But um, there, is, there are some helpers for Ajax and JavaScript within Cake PHP that well, probably wouldn't solve all of these problems, would probably help and you with them. as long as the, the JavaScript is mostly presentation, mm -hmm. 
Right. As long as the JavaScript is mostly presentation, then it's probably the it's probably fine. But in at least mine, it wasn't most. It wasn't just presentation. Right. In project, yeah, project three wasn't all presentation. You did have to have quite a bit of logic there as well. So I suppose it does break down. This model does break down across multiple languages like that. Uh, when you have uh, logic that's spread across the client and the server, but I'm sure that someone somewhere would make an argument that you should have all of your logic in one place and <laughs> all of your presentation in another. Do you have a question? Um, just a point in terms of different ways to run PHP. Uh, what I've done a lot is just type PHP and then start typing THP into standard input, which lets you put in more than one line of code. Oh, so just using the, the P, yeah, so you can just use PHP hit return, then you can enter in multiple lines of code. And then how do you escape out of that? Control C? Uh, or no, yeah, whatever your end of file character is. End of file character. D. OK, Control you need, D. You need to do your less than question one brackets. I see. So you actually have to type out a it's PHP a file. file. I see. So if you type in PHP, you would have to enter in the bracket question mark yeah. and all that, all that stuff. OK. But unless you do you know, if then. Right. You could do complex logic without worrying right. about. Right. It does get messy if you have lots of logic in, in the command line. Is there another question? OK, so um, in the time we have left, I just wanted to talk quickly about um, another framework that exists for JavaScript. So don't say, oh, no, here it comes. This jQuery actually really does make things a lot easier, even just with the way that you are working right now. So um, you, all, all you have to do in order to get this to work is you go to jQuery's website, you download the library, and you upload it to your public HTML, either into its own um, folder or, I mean, I suppose you could reference it directly off of their servers, but then you'd be uh, susceptible to them changing the versions on you or to, uh, if their server is slower than yours, for some reason you might be um, in trouble. And so we have mentioned this a little bit in sections, but it certainly is worth mentioning because it really is useful and it really is important um, for making things really quite easy. So all of this um, H or XML or this response header and all this AJAX calls can be done very, very simply with literally just one line of code with a jQuery. But before we even talk about that, um, if you go to the jQuery website, they have a number of examples even just on the very front page about some of the things that jQuery lets you do. So right here it shows you there's one line of code there's a little run button right there. If I click on the run button, it shows the div. It you know, has some fancy animation, and it grows it, and all of this stuff. It's really, really quite fancy. And so with that in mind, I wanted to show you in a, a couple of examples. So this is a very simple web page. That's, um, on, and again, all of the code will be available off of the course website. And there's a couple of buttons, just three form submission buttons with an enable all, disable all, and an AJAX button. So in the event that you would want to disable all the buttons for some reason, you could just click the disable all button. And it literally disables all of the buttons here. So how does this work? Well, if we take a look first, um, the very first thing we do is include the jQuery library, which is just with the standard uh, it's just the standard JS file and is referenced there. Realize also that you can download not only the standard JavaScript file, so jQuery 1.2.3.js, but you can all also standard, uh, download a version that's been minimized, so it's, it's much smaller. It's been compressed. It's not actually compressed in, in zip format, but all of the variable names have been <coughs> cut shorter to save space and to save uh, bandwidth. So anyway, back to this. So now, um, we have the three buttons at the very bottom here, and just as you would expect, they're all in separate. They're just, just for the ease, um, just to make it easy to explain, they're all separate forms here. And so we have uh, submit zero, submit one, submit two, and on submit, we run a particular JavaScript function. So none of this should be surprising. So disable all buttons JavaScript function, which I defined at the very top. No, I'm not at the very top, I suppose, but up here. And all this does is run a specific jQuery function to disable all of them. So let's break this down. So first, there's a dollar sign here. So this references the jQuery object. So 
a number of JavaScript frameworks actually use a dollar sign to represent their object and the, the methods and the uh, modifications that you can do to the DOM are accessed via this dollar sign. And there are actually ways to run multiple frameworks at once. So for example, I think uh, if you run jQuery at the same time as um, uh, maybe Scriptaculous, which I think also uses a dollar sign, then you might be in trouble. But there are ways to get around it, and that's all on the website. But after that, as an argument to this object, we can actually send it a number of things. And so this is all, again, on their API. But one of the things is all of the submit buttons. So a colon submit references all of the submit buttons that exist in the document. So what we are saying is we're asking the jQuery framework to take a look at all of the submit buttons and modify their attribute. So .attr modifies their attribute to the value or to the attribute name disabled with the value disabled. And all this does is it, since it modifies all of their attributes to be disabled, all it does is it just disables the buttons. So this is pretty basic and probably not very useful because we can't re-enable these buttons without, re, uh, without refreshing the page. So that's where number two comes in. So we click on the, dis the disable all button. It's the same three buttons, but this time it allows us to click on the enable all button as well. So the very top here, we can click enable all and we're able to switch modes this way. And so all of this, while you can certainly do this many different ways logically, this is perhaps a stupid way of doing it. And that is to first disable. So when we disable all the buttons, you disable all of them just like we did previously, and then just re-enable one specifically. So uh, part of the power of jQuery is that you can select specific um, elements with these selectors that they have. So not only are, so we're talking about all the submit buttons, and then more specifically, the submit button that's number one in the form. And since there's zero reference, it's the second one that's on the page itself. So then we're just setting the, at, the disabled attributes to null, which means that it's re-enabled. So, and as you can imagine, then we would want the enable all buttons function to do the opposite. So we could have done this which was very similar to what we did before, where we modify all of the submit buttons and just, and just null all of the attributes or all of the disabled attributes. But in this case, you can actually do XML type, X, XPath type queries and uh, CSS style selectors in the jQuery. So in this case, we're saying all of the input elements whose type attribute is equal to submit, we are going to re-enable. So it's essentially equal to the same thing. We are just finding all of these buttons in a different way. So again, this is the, all of the input types, or yeah, all of the input elements whose attribute type is equal to submit. So this represents all of the submit buttons. So you might want, you might pick one way over another, over another way if you wanted to, um, if you had some specific logic. And indeed, you can actually pick Let's see, so this is, you can actually pick more specific um, buttons with variations of this sort of logic. So again, we have our three buttons. Uh, this is number three.html. We can disable all, we can enable all. It's very similar to before, but this time we just have one line of code for disable all buttons. And look, if you take a look here, what we are saying is, I'll make it a little bit bigger. Uh oh, too big, yeah. So I just want to show the logic that's right here for now. So this is the disable all function. So now we are going to do the similar thing that we just did, but for all of the input elements whose name does not equal submit one, we're going to set the disabled attribute to value disabled. So in this way, we don't have to do that stupid method where we disable all of them and then re-enable one or two selectively. We can just pick one directly out from, um, from this particular query. So similarly, we have the enable all button that can do, that does the same thing where we just look for all of the submit buttons and reference their disabled attribute to null. 
Okay, so this is all well and good. It's certainly useful um, just as examples to see how you can select specific elements and specific um, uh, names and IDs that exist within a document, but where this becomes more powerful is in AJAX sort of, um, in AJAX requests. So here we've, have, we've had this AJAX button this whole time and it hasn't actually been that useful until now where I'll, I can click on the AJAX button and it queries um, a PHP file that I have that all it does is just returns the server time as a JSON um, object and I put that JSON object into one specific div here. So you might think that this is a lot of code to have to deal with, but it's really not. So when you click on that AJAX button, it calls a JavaScript function called do AJAX. From there, we use the jQuery object, uh, specifically the get JSON method, which references my PHP file, json.php, and so I put a question mark, id equals plus id, just to show you that you can indeed pass variables to it, just like you would in a normal get request. And from there, you'll notice that the next uh, argument in this function is a lambda function, or a callback function uh, that you could define separately. But in this case, it's short enough to be in line. You notice that it takes one argument called data. This is the already evaluated JavaScript object that you can manipulate. And so um, here we're going to, we want to reference that one particular paragraph. Uh, so if I scroll down here, you'll notice that I have a P element with, uh, of class foo and ID bar. And I can reference that one specific element with jQuery. Remember that you can do CSS style selection. So after the data has been returned and this lambda function is run, I'm going to use jQuery to select the, the bar ID and change the HTML to data.servertime. And so data is just the data that was returned from the PHP file as a JSON object. And you can imagine that one of the values of the JSON object was server time. And so all it takes is three lines of code in, or, in order to enable all of this. So this can, um, jQuery and a lot of these other JavaScript frameworks can offer you a lot of power for much simplified or much fewer lines of code. Uh, if you just look up the API and take the time to peruse it a little bit, they do have very good um, references and APIs for you to take a look at all of them. So with that in mind, good luck on your final projects. If there's no questions, uh, we will see you in several weeks.